morning and welcome to PPTL Online. We are so excited to have Pastor Rob leading us in worship this morning. We hope you enjoy the service we have planned today. Amen. Well, good morning. Let's worship together this morning. Sing times of refreshing. Well, I thank you, Lord, that you are my Savior. You're my strength and you're the rock on which I stand. You give me life and the grace that's greater. When I humble myself beneath your mighty hand. Sing that again. Well, I thank you, Lord, that you are my Savior. My strength and you're the rock on which I stand. You give me life and a grace that's greater. When I humble myself beneath your mighty hand, you bring times of refreshing. You bring times. For the day will come. For the day will come when we'll all be gathered. And the sun will rise with healing in its wings. And all the years of pain won't seem to matter. When our eyes behold a teacher and a king. And trying to do what's right, you bring times of refreshing to my soul. You bring time, you bring times of refreshing, you bring times of refreshing, you bring times of refreshing to my soul. When I'm with and trying to do what's right. You bring times of refreshing to my soul when I'm weary. When I'm weary from the fight and trying to do what's right. You bring times of refreshing to my soul. Yeah. 
blessing. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name. Of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name when the sun is shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering. Though there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name. Amen. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the dark Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name, oh blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Sing that again. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Amen. Blessed be the name of the Lord. It's so good that, you know, that we can come together and worship in this day. And we, we sense that you're singing right along with us and singing that blessed be the name of the Lord. At this moment, uh, Lila Penny is going to come with a scripture reading. And then Sharon Hodder will be giving us a vocal selection this morning. If you decide for God living a life, of God worship. It follows that if you don't fuss about what's on the table at mealtimes or whether the clothes in your closet are in fashion, there are far more to your life than the food you put in your stomach or more to your outer appearance than the clothes you hang on your body. Look at the birds, free and unfettered, not tied down to a job description, careless in the care of God, and you count far more than to him than birds. Has anyone by fussing in front of the mirror even gotten taller by so much as an inch? All this time and money wasted on fashion, do you think it makes that much difference? Instead of looking at the fashions, walk into the fields and look at the wildflowers. They never primp or shop. 
but have you ever seen color and design quite like it? The 10 best men and women dressed in the century look shabby alongside them. If God gives such attention to the appearance of wildflowers, most of which are never even seen, don't you think he'll attend you? Take pride in you. Do his best for you. What I'm trying to do here is to get you to relax, to not be so preoccupied with getting so you can respond to God's giving. People who don't know God and the way he works fuss over these things, but you know both God and how he works. Steepen your life, God reality, God initiative, God's provisions. Don't worry about missing out. You'll find your everyday human concerns will be met. When you feel forgotten, when you feel you're all alone, when you feel like giving up, when you feel discouraged and everything's uncertain, when you feel you're just not good enough, when it's slipping through your hands, you've done all you can. There's still so much more to do. It's easy to forget in times like this. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. a promise you can hold on to it's easy to forget in times like this Jesus loves you when the funeral is over your company's all gone you're about as broken as can be the sun ain't shining and the nights are just too long and the weight of it all drives you to your knees i to be reminded to it's easy to forget in times like this Jesus loves you Jesus loves you and he cares about everything you're going through your name you can hold on to it's easy to forget in times like this that your name is engraved on the palm of his hands and that's a promise you can hold on to it's easy to forget in times like this. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Yes, Jesus loves you.
sing this together. This song is out of Psalm 23. The chorus says, Surely goodness, surely mercy, right beside me all my days. And I will dwell in your house forever and bless your holy name. Amen. Let's sing this together. Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. In green pastures, he makes me lie down. He restores my soul and leads me on for. Surely goodness, surely mercy, right beside me all my days, and I will dwell in your house forever, and bless your home. trust you, Lord, and surely goodness, surely mercy, right beside me all my days, and I will dwell in your house forever, and bless your home. Prepare a table right before me in the presence of my enemies. Though the arrow flies in the terror of night is at my door, I'll trust you, Lord, and surely. Beside me all my days, and I will dwell in your house forever, and bless your holy name, surely goodness, and surely goodness, surely mercy, right beside me all my days and I will dwell in your house 
Aren't you so glad that you have that living hope this morning? I just want to read a scripture. Hebrews 6, verse 19, 18 and 19. Therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. It leads us through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary. Just want to enter a time of prayer this morning. For many people, this has been a great transition, a time of difficulty. I seen yesterday online that someone I'm in contact with uh, across Canada, they had to sell everything they own just because of this season. Many of people are finding it difficult, rightfully so. And we're praying this morning for those in those circumstances. We're praying for those who've face mainly a passing of a family member and who have been unable to be there up until this point. We're, we're even praying for those who have been maybe had to change their wedding plans over this season. But we're praying that that living hope would just take root in our hearts today like never before. That we can trust God through every season, every circumstance. He's a good, good father. Amen. So let's pray together before we sing one more song. God, you are just that, a good, good Father. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you're doing in our community, even through this online ministry, God. We're praying for families right now that are going through a difficult season, God. We're praying for families maybe find it difficult having their kids home and trying to manage work from home. We're praying for those that you would give them a peace. We're praying for those who have maybe had to go to doctor's appointments in this season and there's been so much fear and anxiety around that. God, we're praying for those facing financial difficulty right now. God, I thank you that we can call you our living hope because of what Jesus did on the cross for us and your love for us and your spirit is alive today and well. And we all long, we all long to get back to some form of normal and to see each other again and to worship together again. But God, we thank you that we can come together each week and each weekend and lift up your name. Even if we're not together in a body, we are, we are gathered together in spirit. So God, we thank you for what you're doing. You're a good, good father. And we pray that right across this island today as we worship, we pray that you would be glorified and you'd be pleased with our worship. And for each message that's going to be spoken this morning, I pray that you would reach people who maybe seem unreachable, God. Reaching the homes that maybe your spirit hasn't been alive and well in there. I pray that there will be awakening today. We ask this in your name. Amen. We're going to sing one more song before Pastor Brian comes with the word this morning. Let's sing this together. So long I have searched for life's meaning Enslaved by the world and The door of my prison was opened by love For the ransom was paid, I was free Sing, I'm free And I'm free from the fear of tomorrow I'm free from the guilt of my past For I've traded my shackles For a glorious song I'm free, praise the Lord, free free. 
I want to thank the worship team for leading us again. Thank them for their commitment. On March 27, 1980, Mount St. Helens erupted. The people of Skamania County near Seattle, Washington, especially those who lived near the eruption zone, were warned for weeks that a major eruption was going to take place. All the signs were there, the spewing of gas, the steam from the surface for weeks, then major signs like the swelling of the side of the mountain like a cancerous tumor. People were evacuated from the area, but over time grew impatient and wanted to go back to their homes and cottages. They figured that if nothing had happened yet, it would be like other times and the volcano would calm down again. But not so. The signs continued to show as the scientists watched and wondered. Some working in the logging industry were still at work, thinking they were far enough away to be safe. A man named Harry R. Truman, 86 years old, was a resident of the U.S. state of Washington who lived near Mount St. Helens. He was the owner and caretaker of Mount St. Helens Lodge at Spirit Lake near the foot of the mountain. And he came to fame as a folk hero in the months preceding the volcano's 1980 eruption after he refused to leave his home despite evacuation orders. Truman is presumed to have been killed by a pyroclastic flow that overtook his lodge and buried his site under 150 feet of volcanic debris. The Mount St. Helens eruption was the deadliest and most economically destructive volcanic event in U.S. history. 57 people were killed, 250 homes 
47 bridges, 15 miles of railway, and 187 miles of highway were destroyed, all because people didn't heed the signs leading up to the catastrophe. Last week, I quoted Mark Hitchcock, who said, and I quote again, it's important for us to keep our eyes on the signs, even when we'd rather look away, yet at the same time, we can't allow ourselves to get enamored with the signs. Signs are important, but they aren't all important. Their only value is to point to something beyond themselves. Signs show us the way and lead us from where we are to where we want to be. And the ultimate place to, we want to be is with Jesus in his kingdom." End of quote. Allow me to review the two returns of Jesus before we move on as well. First of all, we have the rapture. While this is not a biblical word, it is a word that is used in Christianity to mean a catching away. The Greek word from this term rapture is derived, uh, appears in 1 Thessalonians 4.17, and it's translated caught up. The Latin translation of this verse used the word rapturo. The Greek word it translates means to snatch or take away. 1 Thessalonians 4.16-18 says, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. First, the believers who have died will rise from their graves. Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. So encourage each other with these words. Now, as I said last week, this event of the catching away is for all of those who are born again. Believers, regardless of denominational affiliation, from all around the world. After this event, there will be seven years of tribulation. Matthew 24 and 21 says, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, nor ever shall be. Matthew 24 and 29 says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. You see, there will be seven years of trouble after the rapture and distress in this world in which it will lead to a person who will rise up and promise peace to the earth. In the Bible, he is known as the Antichrist, someone who is opposite of Christ. He will appear like he is the answer to the world's problems, and there will be peace and stability for a while. But halfway through the seven years period, all hell will break loose. Not only will there be calamity and destruction, disease, and war around the globe, any person at that time who wants to serve Jesus will have to lay down their lives. If not, you will have to take a mark on your hand or forehead in order to buy or sell. There will be chaos everywhere you look. It sounds unreal, doesn't it? The actual signs that we are seeing now will lead us into this seven-year period called the Tribulation. The last three and a half years will be known as the Great Tribulation. And what we are seeing similar is just a precursor to what will take place. After the seven years, then the second return of Jesus will happen, which is called his second coming. Matthew tells us that many will fall away from the faith. We are seeing that now, but it will be even greater then. Many false prophets, it says, will appear and deceive many. We are seeing that as well, but even worse then and more deceptive. Love will be hard to come by because of what Matthew 24, 12 calls of the increase of wickedness. Matthew and Luke allude to the increase of anti-Semitism around the world, where the nation of Israel and individual Jews will be hated and persecuted. Even persecution against the church and believers around the world is happening every day today. This is another sign where more than 100,000 believers are martyred for their faith each year. Now that doesn't make the news, but this will increase more and more in the tribulation. Friends, we are seeing these things becoming a reality in 2020. If this pandemic has shown us anything, it has shown us how fast our society can be shut down and controlled by fear. In March of 2020, within hours, everything seemed to stand still. I remember looking up into the sky on a sunny day a little while ago, and there was something I didn't see. 
I didn't see airplanes in the sky. The last time that happened was, you guessed it, September 11, 2001. Government can have control, you see, in a heartbeat. Another sign coming out from what will be civil uprising and lawlessness. People will rise up. We have seen more of it again recently. The book of Revelation talks about a mark, Revelation 18, that will be administered if you want to travel, buy or sell, or gain entry and access to where you would need to go. The Word of God in prophecy refers to people not being able to hide. I remember hearing that as a boy and even a teenager before the cell phone era, and I would say, well, how is that possible? But now we know that it is very much possible. I believe that this pandemic has shown governments how easy it is to control the public. If not this pandemic, maybe the next one, or the one after that, that will have a chip inserted under the skin which states whether we have had vaccinations or not, and it could be the digital certificate that gives us freedom to go where we please or stop us from traveling in freedom. Well, many nations are beginning to experience with these new technologies today. I have been reading and listening to what is happening in our world lately and what has been happening over the past few years. Many of you may have already been informed, but let me share with you some of the other possible signs that are taking place. In Sweden, they are starting a study to implant a microchip under the skin of a 2,500-person test group. This chip gives access to your smartphone, logging into your computer and setting your office alarm and quite possibly, eventually, using them as an alternative to cash or cards. Now, as the coronavirus swept across China in early 2020, several news outlets posted stories about the Chinese government laundering money. Now, not in a traditional sense, but in a literal sense. With so many people touching paper currency, China cleaned and disinfected vast amounts in other parts of the world where governments haven't taken similar measures. Many are making a personal choice to avoid paper currency because they're afraid of contracting the coronavirus. This fear of virus-tainted paper money is only the latest event driving the world toward an all-digital financial system. Even in the U.S., because of the delay in getting the $1,200 payments out to the U.S. citizens, many politicians are calling for a government-backed cryptocurrency which will deliver payments faster. This, of course, will eventually give governments unfettered access to people's lives, including their finances. Of course, this is another signpost on the road towards the return of Jesus. Scripture tells us in Revelation 13, 16 to 17, that no one can buy or sell unless they have the mark on their hand or forehead. I read another article just recently by Prophecy News Watch. Let me share a summary of some things from that article. We all know what the United Nations and the World Health Organization is. This UN manifesto of sorts that was ratified and adopted back in 2015, it calls for and has been forcibly moving toward radical plans that will affect everything by the year 2030. Many globalists over the past 10 to 20 years and even longer have openly publicly used these specific terms. There are powerful people with lots of money who are heavily involved with the UN and the WHO, even though they're not official members of either organization. However, they do have a strong voice. Along with some of these powerful people, these organizations have a plan to see radical change in our world by 2030. The UN officially adopts a plan to change everything by 2030 with this promise that no one will be left behind. Enter the people who have an agenda to give everyone on the planet a digital ID and vaccinations. Neither of those are evil in themselves, but when you look at the big picture, the worldview of the players and what the Bible says will happen in the future tribulation, everything is lining up. In other words, quite possibly, there could be a plan by world leaders and other powerful people to have vaccines and digital ID merged together. It's interesting to know that there is a well-known technology talked about in various online tech articles called quantum dot technology. 
Now this, the article says, is the next step beyond microchipping. Todd Hampson in this article says, as I understand it, visible and invisible ink can be tattooed on someone as they are receiving a vaccine. Embedded in this tattoo is digital technology that verifies they have had the said vaccine. Presumably, this could also be technology used to give everyone or anyone a permanent digital ID. That is quite interesting since the book of Revelation talks about a mark and not a microchip. There is also an emerging technology which could quite possibly connect individual humans to a database and a cashless system. All of these things that I have mentioned to you, I believe, are signposts along the road of life which warn us about something up ahead that will endanger our lives if we do not make a detour. Now, today, maybe you can look at me as the man on the road holding up the sign that says, Danger ahead. Please use detour to the right. As I said last week, we are close to the first return of Jesus Christ in the air. It's called the rapture or the catching away of those who know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And let me remind you that nothing else needs to unfold in order for that to happen. The signs we've been talking about are warnings for what will happen after the rapture takes place, the beginning of the seven-year tribulation leading into the second return of Jesus Christ. We have been seeing and are continuing to see the beginning of the labor pains that Romans 8 talks about. It says in verses 22 and 24, For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to this present time. And we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us, as a foretaste of future glory. For we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised us. We were given this hope when we were saved. If we already have something, we don't need to hope for it. I want to speak specifically today, first of all, to the believer. Those who know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, regardless of what church you are affiliated with. I realize that this is not a popular message, even in some of our churches today, but take it from a pastor who has a duty to warn all of those who are not aware or who were once aware but are now lulled to sleep because of the comforts of life. There's nothing wrong with comfort, but when it makes us lethargic and unconcerned about the condition of our world and its affairs, I believe it's time for a wake-up call. If you go to the Word of God, we are told that our duty is to watch, be alert, and to warn. As believers, many have been sedated just enough over time to not notice how groggy we really are. We have taken on the thinking that all we need to do is live our lives in front of people and they will see Jesus in us. This is an excuse to not witness with words for fear of turning people away. That's a fallacy. It is biblical that people are watching our lives and we need to live lives that reflect Christ. However, there comes a time when there is impending danger. We need to open our mouths and speak and shout if necessary. When you do, the Holy Spirit will empower those words and impact the heart of the listener. We are not responsible for the person's response, but we are responsible for sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. The Bible teaches us that there is power in the spoken word of God. Seeds are sown, warnings are given, and people who are asleep will wake up. Many of them will. Ezekiel 33 gives us a picture of a watchman on a wall looking out over the horizon. His job is to watch for the enemy and to see so far out to the horizon that it gives the people he is protecting an opportunity to escape or prepare. It's true we must strive to be the light of the world by being a godly example for others to follow, according to Matthew. But it doesn't stop there. We must also study the Bible so that when people ask us important questions, we'll be prepared to give them biblical answers. Witnessing is not just living, it is telling your story too. We should stay well informed regarding world affairs so we'll be able to help people understand, understanding those events from a biblical perspective. We must learn how God is using us 
his church to go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Now notice it doesn't say go into all the world and just live out the good news. Let me talk to you who do not know Christ today as well. You may not know about him, but you personally do not have a relationship with him. You see, for the believer, the return of Jesus Christ in the air and the return of Jesus to this earth give us hope because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross by giving us an opportunity to restore our relationship with God. We stand confidently on the promise of God when he said, I am going away, but I will come again and take you to be where I am. You see, that's our hope. I have some good news for you today. Jesus' death on the cross is still just as effective today as it was over 2,000 years ago, and it still restores. You can have your relationship with your Heavenly Father restored today. And if you do, you will have the same hope that every other believer has. 1 Peter 1 and 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The reason why this hope is alive with each believer is because Jesus conquered death, hell, and the grave. John 14 and 19 says, In a little while the world will see me no more. You will see me because I live. You will live also. The good news is that Jesus died and rose again to conquer sin and death for you. All you have to do is receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today, and this living hope will be yours. He will soon return again for those who know him as their personal Lord and Savior, and you can be part of it. Do you know him today? My plea to you is that you would call upon him while you still have time. I cannot guarantee a minute from now. Now is the proper time before he comes. Then there will be no fear as to what is taking place in our world. We know that the Word of God is more accurate than tomorrow's news headlines, and we see the signs of warning. Believer, own up to your responsibility, and be reminded that there are two very important types of communication. There are actions, and there are words. Use both in order to get the maximum results. You that have not yet made a decision to serve Jesus, don't be like the man, Mr. Truman, who wouldn't obey the warnings of an impending disaster. He stayed where he was and lost his life. There is hope today. Jesus died for you to have hope. I said, there is hope for you today. Jesus loves you. He died for you. And by his Holy Spirit, he speaks to you right now to receive him as your Lord and Savior. Winston Churchill planned his funeral before he died. His wishes called for a bugler, positioned high in the dome of St. Paul's to play the taps after the benediction. The taps were meant to represent that his physical life was over. But then came the most dramatic turn. As soon as taps was finished, another bugler placed on the other side of the great dome played the notes of Ravelli. It's time to get up, it's time to get up, it's time to get up in the morning. At the end of the history, the last note will not be taps, it will be Ravelli. It's time to get up. Friends, Jesus is coming soon. The trumpet is soon going to sound. Seek the Lord today while you still have time. It's time to get up as a Christian, to wake up to the opportunity of sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. And for you who don't know him, I trust that you will receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today. Because now is the accepted time. Now is your day of salvation. Let's pray together. Father, we bow humbly in your presence today. I understand that this word is a word that might allow the enemy to cause fear in people's lives. Well, it's not meant to cause fear. It's meant to produce hope in their lives today. It's meant for them to see signs so that they can make a detour. And this positive detour will get us around the dangers into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and into heaven with you one of these days. I pray that their decision today will, will be you. They will choose you 
as their Lord and Savior and become part of the bride of Christ that will go when the first return of Jesus in the air happens, and it could be any moment, any second, when you will come and call us home to be with you. We pray, Lord, that your word will open our hearts and open our eyes and our minds to what you are doing and what's happening in our world today. I pray that you will speak powerfully into their lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. May God bless you today, and may you choose Jesus today. It's so encouraging to know that Jesus dying on the cross for us has given us a living hope. We hope you're encouraged this week. Be blessed.